Encounters with Jesus, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Now listen, this is going to be, this is a long chapter. And I tried to cut it out. I took the end of the chapter and I made it our opening scripture today. But you really can't get what's going on here unless you read the whole chapter. So I said, I'm not going to skimp on it. So we're going to read verses 1 through 18. This is this conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus. And it really began to revolutionize his life. So John 3, 1 through 18, you can look at your handouts, or you can look up on the screen here. that will be displayed in a moment. These are the words of John writing this conversation that happened between Jesus and Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very, verily, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very, verily, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God. Notice here he says you can't see the kingdom of God, and then you can't enter the kingdom of God. Two different things here. You can't see what I'm even talking about unless you're born again. And you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to fl flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you don't, do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. But, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from, from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Lord, please add a blessing to your word this morning. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, minds to conceive, the deep truths of the Spirit of God. In this book that John has written, his gospel of the story of Jesus, he describes Nicodemus as a leader of the Jews. Nicodemus was a member of a thing called the Sahedrin. The Sahedrin in Jerusalem was the Supreme Court, or the ruling body of the Jews. Each city around Jerusalem, where you had synagogues, the temple was located in Jerusalem, but you had other cities that had synagogues, where you would practice the Jewish faith and have services and things, but there was only one temple but many synagogues. But around these surrounding cities, no matter how far they were, they had their own Sahedrin, their own ruling body, which functioned kind of like our lower courts do in America. We have lower courts and we have higher courts. But under Roman authority, they stripped every nation they conquered of their authority. But many times they would allow them to keep certain little things that they did so they didn't totally squash them, particularly when it came to religious things. 
So the Romans allowed the nation of Israel to keep some type of their religious system of self-rule. And the Sahedrin in Jerusalem was the final court of appeals on matters of Jewish law and Jewish religion. And when this body did not like you or did not accept you, what happened was is they would squash you. They would disfame your name. They would do everything they could to discredit you. They would smear you, and this is exactly what they did with Jesus. Because Jesus was never going to bow his knee to their corrupt system that they created. In fact, Jesus came to expose this corrupt club, and that's why they hated him so much. Because he knew their game, and they knew he knew their game, and he hated him for that. The Sahedrin were a mixed group of Jewish leaders of the hardline Pharisees who were really strict to the law. And then you had the country club Sadducees, which were a smaller group of this group, and they made up the Supreme Court, as you will, of Judea. Now, John reports that Nicodemus came to speak to Jesus at night. That's why he has the name Nick at night, because he had did everything at night under secret. But what happened was is he met Jesus at night to avoid the Sahedrin finding out about it because they would have turned on him and asked him, what are you doing meeting with this heretic? But there was something about Jesus that sparked curiosity in Nicodemus, and his curiosity was haunting him, so he had to have a conversation. So a nighttime visit was arranged, and also some speculated that Nicodemus was actually a spy. He was a spy for the Sahedrin, to get some things to charge Jesus against with blasphemy so they get rid of him. But because he was a member of this ruling council, that was one of his jobs, to make sure that the people would not be led astray by some of these teachers. During the times of Jesus, there were many people teaching many things. I mean, there were many people claiming to be messiahs, many people that claimed to be rabbis and teachers, and they were teaching many things that were off from the Jewish law. So they were always looking for people who were preaching counterfeits or heresies. That would have been Nicodemus's job. But that's not what he was doing. He truly wanted to know who this Jesus was because he could not deny the miracles he was doing, the power he was walking in, the people who were drawn to him. They could not deny that. There's something about this Jesus I have to find out about. But if I do it during the day, I'm going to be ridiculed, I'm going to be taken to task by my fellow members of the Sahedrin, so I'm going to do it at night. But what happens is, immediately Jesus confronts Nicodemus with the truth that you must be born again. You have to be born a second time, which means you have to be spiritually reborn as well as naturally born. That has to happen. And he rebukes and reprimands Nicodemus with this, probably gently. I don't think he did it harshly. He did it gently. He said, since you are a leader of the Jews, you should know this already. But Jesus goes and gives a further explanation of the new birth. And in the context of what we're talking about in John 3.16, of which is one of the most well-known, beloved verses in the Bible, what's interesting to note here is this meeting was never arranged to, you know, basically bring Nicodemus to Christ. It was to find out who this guy was, to ask specific questions. And I think Nicodemus was kind of awestruck by the words that Jesus gave him because Jesus gave him direct answers to his questions. And what it was is when the word born again comes into play, it means being spiritually reborn or a spiritual birth in addition to a natural birth. When a dead spirit inside of a sinful person that is dead to God and has no need for God, doesn't want God, when that is supernaturally resurrected, that is a miracle. And that has to happen in the life of a person in order to see the kingdom of God and enter the kingdom of God. And we know that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let me expound on this word believe. This word believe in the Greek doesn't mean, well, yeah, I believe. I believe the carpet's blue. You know, 
I believe, I, you know, I believe the sky is blue. I believe, you know, whatever. That's just a, a casual belief. This word believe in the Greek, it means to cling to. It means to hold on to. It means to trust in as a savior for our sins. And it's the only way forward. It's the only way to salvation. He's it, there's no other. That word believe in the Greek, that's what it means. To cling to and hold on to. There is no other. He is the real deal. We also would, we wouldn't have gems like John 3, 16. We wouldn't have a lot of things that we believe in. Look, how about the, would Jesus allude to this thing that happened in the wilderness in the book of Numbers? When the children of Israel were rebelling in the desert, you can read this in the book of Numbers chapter 21. When Moses was leading the children of Israel to the promised land, they were rebelling. Boy, they had lots of rebellion problems. And what happened was, is they began to rebel against Moses and against God. So what God did is he said, I'm gonna send a bunch of poisonous snakes to bite them and they're gonna die in the wilderness. And that snake bite equated, it was a symbolic to sin. And they begin to die by numbers and they begin to cry out and say, Moses, we have sinned against you and God. Please have mercy, have mercy. So what happened was God said to Moses, I want you to erect a pole and I want you to put a bronze snake around it. And those who will look at the snake on the pole will be saved and be healed of their snake bite. And that's what happened, but that was, that was a symbolic thing that was coming in the future. And Jesus told Nicodemus, when Moses did that in the desert, it was a representation of what was coming with me. Because as the Son of Man is lifted up, everyone who believes in me and looks to me will have eternal life and be healed from their snake bite of sin. And this meeting that you called in the dark, Nicodemus, is a wake-up call for you. I am truly Israel's Messiah, and you better get that because you're having a personal invitation, a personal meeting with me right now, and this is your only chance to really hear what I have to say to you personally. Also, we have another truth where everybody is guilty as charged. The verdict is in. Men like darkness and will not come to the light to be exposed. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the Son, God's one and only Son. Remember in the Greek it says to cling to, trust in, walk with, total embrace in him as Lord and there is no other. That's what this word believe means in the Greek. Jesus comes before everything in our lives. That's saving faith in a nutshell. We wouldn't have those truths that we know if this meeting never had. We'd never have John 16, 316. We'd never have John 318. We would never have these things if this meeting never happened. So the Holy Spirit made sure that this meeting made it into the canon of Scripture so we can derive many things from it. So what we're gonna do right now, real quickly, there's many things that Nicodemus can teach us as believers in Jesus, as we need to grow up in Jesus. So let's look at a few of them right now. I got three of them. Three lessons of spiritual growth from Nicodemus. You're gonna find this interesting, hopefully, because every one of us is in a place right now, what I'm gonna talk about. And many of you are trying to share the gospel with people in your family, people at work, people in your neighborhood, and people, friends, you're trying to share the gospel with them. And they're in this place right now that I'm gonna speak of where they're kind of curious or they're resistant, but there's something happening as you're speaking to them. Number one, you get to the curious stage with Jesus. The curious stage with Jesus. Now, this is John 3, 1 through 6. I think Caleb's going to put this up on the screen. Thank you, Caleb. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you were doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. What's happening here is that everyone has a starting point with Jesus. Everyone. Even if you were a little child raised in the church, that's your starting point. Or maybe you're a teenager or a young adult in your 20s and you come to Christ. Or you're investigating Christ. That's your starting point. Or you're an adult. I mean, you basically could be in your 50s and come to Christ. That's your starting point. Everyone has a starting point with Jesus somewhere, and many of us can go back and remember what our starting point was. But we can also remember what our curious stage was. When we begin to hear things about Christ, we begin to maybe read a little scripture, or maybe somebody was witnessing to us, and it was very strange. But we were curious to what they were saying. We didn't buy in yet, but we were curious. This is what Nicodemus is. So what's happening is, there is a sin dilemma that's happening that only Jesus can fix. And this is what he's telling Nicodemus. And what happens is, so the beginning of their faith journey, I can still remember when my faith journey started. I came to Christ and I didn't even believe what I was saying. When I, I just came to Christ, I said, it sounds good, it's weird, it's strange, but I'll try it. I can remember that in 1984. I mean, I can remember, I was 26 years old. I, it was really leery about it, but something, something sounded good. But I didn't come that night. I had been spoken to a few times before that. So I came, and it was very curious. And when I got saved, the first church I went to was a Pentecostal church that had a tent revivalist as their pastor. So what they would do is they'd have tent revivals in the backyard in the summer, and you would walk in, and I saw these people jumping all over the place and, you know, screaming and hollering and getting delivered of stuff, and, and I sat way in the back because I said, I need to sit way in the back because I need to get out of here quick if I have to. This is crazy stuff. <laughs> was brand new, brand new. But I'll tell you, I, I went another night, I went another night, and I said, this is crazy. So I went back to the church service when, after the revivals were over. But this pastor was the same guy. I mean, he'd be hanging off the chandelier preaching. I mean, he's pre just an old-time South Carolina Pentecostal guy. That was my first exposure to Christianity. And it was weird, it was strange, a little bit scary. It doesn't scare me anymore. But boy, back then I was really wigged out. But I began my journey with Jesus. I began to walk with Jesus. I didn't know anything. But I know people were getting changed every single night. People were getting saved every night. Because he, he, in his heart, he was an evangelist. That's what he was. He wasn't a pastor. He planted a church. He was an evangelist. And, it was, it, you know, I learned a lot of things from him. I learned some things that weren't good and some things that were good. So what I'm saying is everybody has a beginning. So what happens is when we are in this curious stage where Nicodemus was, we are in the place where we're investigating who is this Jesus? When you witness to people and you talk to people, you feel a little resistance. You feel like they look at you as you're a little weird, because you are weird. When you, witness, when you are saved, filled with God's Spirit, and you begin to witness to people, you are weird. I am weird. I'm just telling you right now, you're a little weird to them, okay? And you know what? Because they can't see the kingdom of God yet. They can't see. They can't see what you see. And when they can't see what you see, it aggravates you. Doesn't it aggravate you? Why can't you see what I'm talking about? You need Jesus. You need, heaven and hell is in the balance here. You need Jesus. Not only for that, you need Jesus to walk with you. You need a God to take care of you, to fellowship him, to walk with. They're saying, really? I mean, they think you're weird. Because you are weird to them. You're not weird to me, you're weird to them. So what's happening is when we're in that place, we get to the place where they're kind of buying what you're saying, but they're not buying in yet. But what happens is when we come at them like a used car salesman to try to manipulate, to try to pressure, to try to get them to accept Christ, they're not going to like that. I won't like that. When you go to a car dealership and they do that, you don't like that. And neither does somebody who is not a believer yet. But they may be entering into curious stage 
if we do it with love, grace, and patience. We may be able to develop that relationship with them, let them see Jesus in us. But that curious stage is what Nicodemus was. He was not a believer yet, but he was curious. He was curious. And Jesus didn't push anything on Nicodemus. He didn't. What did he do? He answered his questions. All he did was answer his questions, and then he let the decision-making be with Nicodemus. That's what he did. But what he did is he modeled God in front of him. He was God, but he modeled God in front of Nicodemus. He challenged him. He answered his questions. But I believe we also love them as well. So what we do is we model Christ, we answer questions, we give knowledge, we let them make a decision, we be patient, because remember this, we don't save people. Jesus saves people. We are just the conduit. You don't have the miracle working power, neither do I, to save anybody. Okay? That is a supernatural thing the Holy Spirit does to bring somebody to Christ. So in the curious stage, be patient, people. Be patient, answer their questions, model Christ in front of them, even if they make fun of you. That's part of the deal, all right? But be patient, be strong, model Christ, and pray for them. Pray for them. Number two, so we see Nicodemus was in this curious stage. Now we're entering into the next stage of walking with Jesus. It is the sensitivity stage with Jesus. And this is very interesting, this point is very interesting. We see the uh, sensitivity stage with Jesus, and this is the abridged John chapter 7, 32 to 52. It's not all 20 verses. I just picked, Cherry picked some verses here. To set this up, the Sahedrin sent out the temple guards to go arrest Jesus. And they showed up, and they were listening to him. They were waiting for their opportunity to say, is he done yet? I, guess, I don't want to, I want to arrest him, but he's kind of in the middle of something. And his words were so powerful, so convicting, so much knowledge, so much understanding. The temple gods were just sitting there saying, I, we need to buy, the, we need to buy the, you know, the, the tape to this thing, okay? This is a great message. So they came back and reported, verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple gods to arrest him. Finally, the temple gods went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees, who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the gods replied. You mean that he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. You have, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. What a bunch of elitists. My, my goodness. Looking down there, big nose towards everybody who is less than. There's always been elitists. There's elitists now in the world, and there's always been elitists. I digress, excuse me. All right? Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their number, own number, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Well, I guess Nicodemus wasn't going to invite to dinner for a while. Even the temple guards who went to arrest Jesus were amazed by his teaching. And they couldn't even arrest him because they couldn't arrest him. They're saying, I, I, I want to hear the rest of the message. I can't arrest him. And this really frosted the pumpkins of the Pharisees and the Sahedrin. Now, a little time had passed when the secret meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus occurred. And what happened was Nicodemus was now in a room full of hostility. The holidays are coming, by the way. You ever been around family who doesn't love Jesus during the holidays? Talk politics, talk different things, talk faith, talk government, talk Jesus. It doesn't always go so well. It's a room of hostility. You could be in a room of hostility at work. 
You can be in a room of hostility in family. You can be in a room of hostility at any venue. You can be in a room of hostility with your Jesus, and they don't have it. Nicodemus was now in a room of hostility. What does he do? He speaks up. He speaks up because he's in the sensitive stage now. Nicodemus was now beyond the curious stage with Jesus, and now he's becoming sensitive towards Jesus because God began to work in his heart, and God began to open his eyes as well. He wasn't quite there yet, but he was on his way. However, he began to see the pride, the rage, the jealousy, the arrogance of the people that he served in the Sahedrin with, and it began to turn him off. And he also probably began to think, I used to be like these guys, but I don't want to be like these guys anymore. But now there was something about this Jesus fella that was genuine, wise, godly, truthful. And he speaks with incredible wisdom, knowledge, and authority and signs and wonders that I cannot deny. What if he is who he says he is? What if he really is the Messiah? Maybe I had this Messiah concept in my thinking all wrong. I better be careful about condemning Jesus like these other guys are. When you are witnessing to people or you are sharing the gospel, maybe they might go beyond the the curious stage and they might enter into the sensitivity stage where they say, you know what he or she is sharing with me? I can't deny what I see in their life. I see Jesus in their life. Even though I don't like it, I can't deny what I see. And I better be very careful because of what they're telling me is true. I better really weigh this if Jesus really is the Savior of the world and there is a heaven and hell, I better weigh what this person is telling me. That's when we witness the people when they're in the sensitivity stage. They become very cautious because God begins to work on their heart over this time. So Nicodemus took a risk to defend Jesus when everybody else in this room was ready to put him on a spit and barbecue him. That takes guts. That takes conviction. That takes risk. But he was sensitive to about the things of Jesus. This is what Nicodemus, basically, when he was sensitive, he said, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? They replied, they yelled at him, are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. What's going on here? Nicodemus took a risk. And he now began to separate from the group. And began, he began to become alienated from this group. Many of us can remember this phase of our journey when we became sensitive to Jesus. And what happens is Nicodemus was becoming sensitive and his heart was beginning to change. Do you remember when Peter, when Jesus was arrested, and Jesus predicted this, that he was going to deny him three times? Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. You think you're such a bad guy? You think, you, you think you're tough? You think you can stand? Let me tell you something. You said you'd never deny me, and you said you'd even go to prison for me? You're going to deny you even know me three times. Peter said, you're out of your mind. He said this to himself. Well, what happens was we know the story. When Jesus was arrested, Peter denied even knowing Jesus or being associated with him three times. And then, why? Because he was doing things in his own power. Then we see when Pentecost happened and the group of 120 was in the upper room in the book of Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came down. And Peter was the first one to stand up with power and testify about the risen Savior, basically saying to the group, you are responsible for killing Jesus. It's your fault. You better repent and save yourself from this corrupt generation and from the eternity to come while there's still a chance. And in that boldness, as we know, 3,000 people came to Christ that day. What was the problem with Peter when he was a disciple? He was relying on his own power, strength, and moxie to fight a spiritual battle. And we cannot do that. To overcome fear, to stand for the Lord in hostile environments. We cannot do that in our own power and strength. You can do it if you're a very arrogant person, but arrogance doesn't win anybody to Christ. So arrogance can stand in any battle, but that doesn't win people to Christ. 
But to stand in the battle when people are opposing you and when they're beginning to trash the Jesus you love or you're becoming sensitive to, it hurts you because you're beginning to identify with Jesus. You have to do it in the Holy Spirit's power where you say, Holy Spirit, help me to stand for truth and to love them, not be arrogant and not speak down to them and not get into a fight so I can be right and they can be wrong. I know people like that who are Christians. they got to be right. They cannot be wrong. Arrogance doesn't win anybody to Christ. It's love and grace and mercy and patience that brings people to Christ. That's what wins people to Christ. This is what Nicodemus was dealing with in a hostile environment. He was developing a love for Jesus. He was sensitive to Jesus, and it helped him to stand up and speak for Jesus. Even though it wasn't easy, he did it because he was becoming sensitive to Jesus. Let me ask you a question as I move to point number three. If someone insults your spouse, insults your significant other, your parent, your sibling, your child, your friend, I haven't met anybody yet who will just sit there and not respond. Why? Because it hurts you. Because you love them and you're sensitive to it. It's all because we love those people. And when you trash someone we love, it's an assault on us. Well, this is the way it is when we are developing a love for Jesus. When people begin to trash him in this society or in our social groups, it's an offense to us. Because we're no longer in the curious stage. We are now in the sensitivity stage where Jesus is becoming more real to us. And we begin, we're becoming a place where we're beginning to identify with him. And we stand up and we say some things. This is where Nicodemus was. This is growth. You can chart his growth. I'm going to end with this. Number three, fully identified stage with Jesus. The fully identified stage with Jesus. John 19, 38 through 42. Later, Joseph, this is, also, this is obviously beyond and after the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. See the power they had? While Pilate's, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was a Accompanied by who? Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I'll give you this final remark. This is the fully identified stage with Jesus. Now Nicodemus over the course of time grew in the grace of God and fully identified with Jesus. He didn't care any longer about his reputation, loss of friends, loss of privileges. That didn't matter anymore. He knew Jesus was who he said he was, and he believed in him, and he was a follower of Christ, fully identified. Look at this. At the, this is the man who met with Jesus in secret. Now at the most unpopular time to be identified as a follower of Jesus, when he was dead, he was bloodied on the cross. They took him down and seemingly, I say seemingly, defeated by the Jewish leaders who hated him. With Nicodemus being a part of that leadership, but not for long. He was seen wrapping the body of Jesus with Joseph of Arimathea, 75 pounds of mixture of myrrh and aloes. This was very, very expensive. This cost Nicodemus a lot of money. This was the time when most of Jesus' disciples were running for their own lives. They were scattered 
after spending three years with Jesus, after seeing all his miracles and all his exorcisms. Nicodemus here is showing more faith and love for Jesus than they were. This is why this stage of fully identified with Jesus is so important to get in the life of a Christian. Nicodemus was identified with Jesus at a very unpopular time in Jesus' life. Not caring what anyone thought, what he did is he embraced Jesus and he didn't care what anybody thought. In a similar way, the church today is living in the days globally when the biblical Jesus and the life he's called his true followers to live is becoming increasingly hostile to the church on the earth all around the world who will identify with Jesus. Not a mixture of the world and Jesus to avoid persecution. No, I mean the true spirit-filled biblical church that's gonna walk with Jesus no matter what, the end time bride. It's becoming more hostile every day for all of us. We are in the same place today as Nicodemus was in that room with the Sahedrin and now with the dead body of Jesus. Even though it's uncomfortable at times, my friends, to suffer the scorn of being a true Christian in an increasingly pagan society that is crying out for their sin to be celebrated. They are crying out for their sin to be celebrated. That's what a pagan society does. And they do not want to repent of it. They want to celebrate it. What happens to a true Christian in that society? We are going to be seen increasingly as the problem, not the solution. We are going to be seen as a hindrance to the solution of the utopia they are trying to build. The devil has truly blinded the eyes of those who don't believe. Truly. The Apostle Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. But like Peter buckled three times of denying Jesus because he didn't want to fully be identified with Jesus when he got arrested for fear of his own life. Don't miss this. We will buckle as well. We will buckle as well. If we care more about what people think than what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit think of us. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Be fully identified with our Savior. Because when we are in pressure to walk with Jesus, that pressure will produce perseverance. And that perseverance will really give us backbone. And as the Holy Spirit continues to do his work in us, it will make us grow to make us the Christians and the believers we need to be together to go the distance he's called us to go until he takes us out of here at the rapture. Know this, my friends, we will be put, like Nicodemus, we will be put in situations that will test our faith and test our identif identification with Jesus. We will be put in those places. But what it'll do, it'll strengthen us and strengthen our commitment with Jesus. As one side of us will want to run in fear and cower down, the other side says, no, Holy Spirit, strengthen me. I will stand for Jesus no matter what. When we do that, we become stronger. We become stronger. It is a test that we're put in. Nicodemus was being tested, but he grew through it. And that's what he teaches us here today. My friends, that's a good place to be in. And as Nicodemus had his encounter with Jesus, we can chart his growth as a believer to become fully identified with Jesus. This is where the church needs to be today. Fully identified with Jesus. No matter what the government says, the government doesn't want... If you're a true Christian, it, it's not for you. It's against you. Come around Pride Week, okay? Now it's Pride Week, Trans Week, all these... They, sell, they get in the Rose Garden and they say, We celebrate you. We're for you. We love you. You know what that's saying? Christians are the problem. Every year it gets hyped up more and more and more. Because the government is becoming more pagan, more secular. It is what it is. I mean, the Bible predicted this. We still have to pray for our government, pray for our leaders, and pray that God would do a work in our government. But I know what I see on the news. I know what I see. You know what you see. When they celebrate sin from the highest place in the country, 
then that means you and I are the problem. We have to be taken out of the way so sin can be celebrated. It's all political games, believe me. I personally believe the government doesn't care about anybody. They don't care about anybody. They care about themselves and advancing their agendas. That's my own personal government diagnosis. But government is a necessary tool. We need governments to, to basically govern people. God instilled that. But know this, as the, as the world and our culture becomes more paganistic, it becomes less Christian. And the true church needs to stand in these times and teach our children, teach our grandchildren, and encourage one another to stand true and be fully identified with Jesus in the days we're living in. And if we don't do that, we will become weakened Christians with no light, no salt, and no power. I don't want to be that way. I want to be true and strong as the Holy Spirit strengthens me, challenges me, helps me to stand up and rise up to be fully identified with Jesus. You know what? I'm telling you. And in the end, you're going to be proven right. When you stand before the king one day and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant, you will see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. That's my reward one day. So for now, the church and the earth that we are, we stand strong together, and we want to be fully identified with Jesus, and we don't back down. But we don't have to be arrogant. We have to stand in love, truth, and grace, and show the world why, the reason why we live for our Jesus and who he is. Amen for that? All right. Thank you, Nicodemus, for teaching us many things as you stood strong and grew in the grace of God. Help us to do the same. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are the God who keeps us, who strengthens us. You sent the Holy Spirit to fill us with a, with a new strength and power to witness for you, to stand for you, to walk with you, and to grow with you. There is something alive in us, Lord. It's the Holy Spirit. We can't back down. The true church can't run away. We pray right now, Lord, we pray for our government and the governments around the world that, Lord, they would have some sense of an awakening to the true gospel of Christ. We pray that, Lord, because nothing's impossible for you. So we pray impossible prayers. Lord, whether we're in the end times and we're heading towards that final chapter of history and all the worlds, I just heard the Pope just say the other day that all the world's religions are the same. All religions, Islam, everything, they're all pathways to God. What a lie that is. That's a lie. But many are beginning to believe that. And in the end times, many will come into this one world religion that's coming. People are being conditioned for it right now. But Lord, your people are walking in truth. Your people are walking that, that we know that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the life. There is no other. We stand today, Lord, and we declare that. And we thank you for that. We're not being arrogant. We're being bold to say, I believe the Bible. It is true. And I believe Jesus came to save us. I believe Jesus has a place for us in heaven. He's coming back for his church. He's going to bring us home to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to return with, with him when he sets up the new millennium and destroys the Antichrist, the devil, and everything else. And we will rule and reign with him when he comes back. That is our faith declaration because that's what the Bible teaches. Help us, Lord, to stand strong in this hour and day that we live in. We thank you so much, Lord, for the love that we have for you. Increase our love for you, Lord, because it's the love. It's not faith in Jesus. It's the love of Jesus that helps us to stand. That When they offend you, they offend us and because we are really born from above filled with the Holy Spirit. Increase our love and our children's love for you and our grandchildren's love for you to stand up for Jesus in this hour. Thank you, Lord. We pray a bold prayer that you would embolden your people to be witnesses for Christ's kingdom in this last days we're living in. We love you so much, Lord. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now we're going to sing one last song.